Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm Eric Fisher, and this is the podcast where we talk to the people behind the productivity, not just about becoming more efficient and effective, but about doing work with meaning and purpose. This week, I'm talking with Ben Elijah, an independent writer, speaker, and coach based out of London. His main thing is to study the relationship between information and how it affects the way we live and work. And by mastering that relationship, we can promote productivity, creativity, and well-being. Sounds awesome. Ben and I had an awesome conversation. Before you get to listen to that, I want to say thank you to Doodle for sponsoring this episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Doodle is the online scheduler that makes it easier to schedule your online meetings with one or more people. In fact, I guess you probably don't even have to have it be an online meeting. It's just an online scheduling tool. Pretty cool. It makes it easier. It makes it easier than herding those cats or playing ping pong back and forth with one or more people. You go to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. You can get started for free. They even have personal branding scheduling pages that are called Meet Me. I am one of, and I know a number of you are as well, members of the 24 million people that are monthly using Doodle to schedule their events, their meetings, their coaching even. You can get started for free using Doodle by going to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. Once you try it out and you love it, because I know you will, if you need additional features, you can go to Doodle Premium for $39 for the entire year. I love it because it's got calendar integration and notifications and much more. So again, get started. Go to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. Let me know if you've tried it out. I'd love to hear from you. This week, it's my privilege to talk with Ben Elijah. He's a writer, a speaker. He He thinks about words and he writes them. <laughs> he thinks about work and uh, comes at it from the, and and information, which is one of the. I mean, I think I'm probably a geek in that sense too. Is thinking about not just the information you consume, uh, but how you consume it, why you consume it, the amount that you're consuming, all from a psychological and just a, a philosophical, even a a uh, philosoph philosophical. That's a wrong word. Anyway, Ben, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. Great, um, to, see, great to talk with you. Yeah. They, well, great to talk with you finally, too. And so uh, I almost said falafel. That's not right. Philosophical. Let's start there. I could, I could handle falafel. Yeah, I could, too. Let's do that. Um, mm-hmm. But philosophical, it's philosophy. It's, it's the, the, what does that word mean to you? <laughs> Well, yeah, it's a good one. I suppose, um, you know, the, the literal Greek translation is love of wisdom. But, um, uh, you know, for me, how can I put this uh, without sounding completely pretentious? Um, oh, no, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> we, we're laughing. We'll have fun. Don't. All right, awesome. no, there's no pretension. There's no pretense here. So. So, OK, there's been life on this planet for like, you know, you know, billions of years and. This is the first time that any species has developed the internet, right? Uh huh. And we've been using written words for, you know, what six thousand years, depending on who you talk to. Mm-hmm. This is all. This is all kind of brand new, isn't it? Like everything we're doing is is abs- when we're talking about information is completely brand new to the human condition, and that absolutely obsesses me. I find that absolutely fascinating, and the kind of impact that that creates and of course, we're in this situation now where you know, people talk about information overload a lot, which, you know, I might I question the term, but our brains are fundamentally unsuited for this world that they've created. And that's an interesting contradiction that, uh, you know, I'm quite interested in exploring. Yeah. And and I get I get what you're saying about information overload. I think you quoted um, David Allen in, in your book, as well mm. as uh, he even said something along the lines of it when he was on the show last about if you go out into nature you can get information overload there too. There's all these anywhere you are, where if your eyes are open, your ears are open, you know, anywhere at all times, there is information to absorb, to observe, 
Um, that's why people are thinking. It, 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 I think that uh, there's a nuance to it, though, when it comes to, you know, I, again, we've got an upcoming episode where I'm going to talk to a couple people about the Apple Watch. And people mm-hmm. are some people are afraid of it. They're thinking, why do I want to strap something onto my wrist that's going to give me more information? But I, I think it's – anyway, it's, it, it is an interesting question. It is an interesting topic to bring up. Well, I, I guess it's one, you know, one of the, the fascinating things about um, that quote from David Allen is that – um, it's not about the information itself. It's about the decisions you've got to make about it and the kind of, you know, psychological burden that that imposes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's about deciding if there's meaning behind any of that information. Right. And if what that meaning is, if you need to do anything about it or not. Well, this is, this is absolutely true. And there's this wonderful, um, sense that if that information is neither relevant nor urgent, then it's just sort of, it, it's kind of noise and um, not necessarily in a bad way. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. taking, taking a walk through a forest, there's a lot of visual noise and it's, you know, it's, it's a relaxing and it's a very um, calming experience. Yeah. Um, we wouldn't even call that noise. We'd maybe call it ambience or environment. Yeah. That's probably a more accurate term. I guess I was thinking in terms of signal and noise, but yeah. Well, that, yeah. It, it, and I, now I see where you're saying. Yes. Right. No, well, I guess, um, you know, one of the things that I was very interested in, while I was putting the productivity habits together, uh, which is my book, was this idea of, you know, what is the difference between relevance and urgency? And I think it's an interesting problem as we're, we're surrounded by technologies where kind of left to their own devices, they might, you know, buzz us and ping us at every available opportunity. And, you know, I don't know whether that's going to continue. But I guess, you know, if something's, you know, truly, truly urgent, like, you know, a loved one's in hospital or something like that, I do want to know about that. I don't necessarily need to know when I get a tweet, even if it's something that's quite relevant to me. Mm-hmm. I might not need to you know, be made aware of that so instantly and I can just set up a kind of cadence for, for reviewing it. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, totally. And I think just having some way of expressing that and having a way of a kind of controlling the way that you treat these different channels of information to say, OK, well, if it's very relevant, then that's telling me that, you know, when I do review it, I want to give it a lot of attention. So. If there's a novel that you love or a film that you adore, then you're dedicating a fair amount of attention to it. Uh, maybe not so much with my emails. But if it's urgent, then perhaps I want to grant it the right to distract me or to notify me. You know, so if you explore those different concepts and your decision based on relevance or urgency, you could then say, well, that's a measure of the, the relative importance of the channel. Does that make any sense? Oh, totally. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking while you're saying this, I'm thinking in my mind, I've kind of done this decision making in in terms of notification at least with my and I I wish there was a little more a little bit more granularity available but I'm thinking about my iPhone and I'm thinking about notifications and how I've pretty much got everything turned off as far mm-hmm. as anything I mean isn't our natural inclination even people on a an Android phone, I, I suppose, where you install a new app and the first thing it does is it asks you, <laughs> uh, this app would like to send you notifications. And I always say no, <laughs> always, because if I want it to say yes, if I want to say yes, I'm going to go back later and say yes. You know what I mean? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a human element to this as well. I don't think that there's a fully technological answer to this mm-hmm. problem. And, and, you know, that may change as, you know, I don't know if, you know, if, if this is going to, if this is something where machine learning can take over some of this, I don't know. But I've kind of, <laughs> this is going to sound so sad, but I've um, tried to educate my friends and family and my colleagues to, you know, who are, you know, they're, they're like, you know, my VIPs. Um, but I've tried to educate them to send me messages that are truly urgent using an app like Threema, for example, which is just a you know a th- a, another sort of messaging service. I, I like it because it's uh, uh, it's pretty secure, and uh, you know I'm I'm interested in security, and that's something that I'm going to allow to make a noise, or I'm going to let it buzz in my pocket, but I'm not going to let my standard messages get through to me that oh, way. Oh, that's a good idea. What was the name of that again? Uh, Threema, so three T H R W E M A, and it's a really really cool um, secure messaging. Uh, tool which is you know cross-platform it's really really nice but it's designed so that uh, man in the middle attacks are impossible against it so you know i I talk to people who do a lot of traveling into some politically hot places in the world and uh, you know so being able to ensure that those communications aren't being intercepted is quite important yeah i was thinking this the other day it'd be great if there was a way to turn off a certain channel like messages altogether but still allow 
something to get through if it was an emergency. And so I would have that peace of mind that if something really was truly urgent, it would reach me. But otherwise, there wouldn't be any distraction or or, uh, notification or or noise. Totally. Well, there's a kind of a... I guess a social contract that goes with that um, when you when you talk with your friends and family and colleagues that, you know what, if you email me, I'm going to look at it, but I check my emails once a day because I've now trusted that anyone who sends me something that wants more urgent attention is going to use a different channel. So I do review it. But the thing is, is that you establish a cadence for reviewing a particular channel and that cadence is related to the volume and urgency. So the more urgent, uh, which is to say, you know, it might be urgent and relevant, in which case you don't want it to notify you as such, but you do want to review it more frequently if it's if it's sort of really important. But then divided by the volume. So if it's really high volume, then you want to check it less often. And that's because it's more efficient to batch it up almost. It's more efficient to check off 100 emails than you know, once than 10 emails ten times. You know, you can then say, well, you know what, if I'm getting something which is high volume and high urgency, then that's an alarm that you need to maybe review the way that you're treating that channel does that does that make sense yeah definitely i I was going to call attention to well if something's uh if a channel of a certain channel um like email for example seems to be receiving a lot of messages wouldn't you want to check it more often to make sure there's less there but i see your point about batching that makes a lot of sense (laughs) well there's overhead associated with all of this right Mm -hmm. and I want to just minimize the overhead and maximize the value. And, uh, you know, it just seems to me that if I'm getting 100 emails a day, then it kind of makes sense that I put 15 minutes into just sort of burning through them as soon as possible rather than kind of just living on tenterhooks, assuming that, oh, God, is there going to be – is one of these emails going to contain a grenade? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I know that for you and in this realm of information, you talk about productivity not just being about – how much you're able to create or produce or juggling lots of plates. But, well, you focus on mastery uh, Mm. or perspective and not just mastery in general, but yourself and your resources and your your time, your attention. In other Mm. words, being able to decide what deserves your attention. So how do we, with all these different channels, decide or what is your decision process, in other words, of, of walking through and deciding how (laughs) <laughs> you know, what gets your attention? So that's a really, really good question. And I, I'm I'm painfully aware that when I answer it, my answers are incomplete. <laughs> um, because I kind of feel like I'm still a student of all this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, th- um, I think, to, in a sense, we all are still. I can answer that, you know, someone who is a, uh, I guess, a concert pianist is going to be more inclined to notice great piano playing or is going to be more inclined to notice a particular kind of piano as they walk past the music shop. Or someone who's an expert historian is going to be more inclined to notice a historical error on a TV documentary. Um, so our areas of expertise form the things that you know we're kind of tuned to give our attention to. And so that, and obviously not just our areas of expertise, but our, our areas of interest um, is probably the, the, the more accurate term. Yeah. So... I guess what that really means is um, is that it's very important, in my opinion, to have clear control over the things that you find interesting, or not control, or clear at least clear awareness of the things that you do find interesting, so that you can quite clearly st- say that you know when you're reading, uh, you know, like a, a crappy tabloid, for example, that you know you might be le- you know reading about you know Kim Kardashian's backside, and that might be interesting, but it's not. You, you know that it's not something that you truly care about because that's not what your mission is. I would hope that that I, I would hope I that, would hope <laughs> I would hope that Kim Kardashian's backside is not anybody's mission. But there there's the tweetable quote of this episode. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I, that's a rabbit hole. I'm not going to go down. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I think for me, what's very important, and this is actually going to be the topic of my uh, of my next book. Is trying to understand, it can, you know, uh, you know I, and I try and be systematic about this, but even just more, um, you know, more generally, if you can be conscious of the things that you truly care about as a person, and if you can, you know, you can state that and you can relate the things that you're working on to the things that you really deeply care about. So, you know, can I relate? And I, I think I use this phrase in the book, you know, can I relate the next five minutes of my life to why I'm on the planet? 
And if you can establish that kind of relationship, then you're in a much better position to say, you know, to look at all this this carousel of information that you're getting every day and say relevant, relevant, irrelevant, 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 you know, yes, no, yes, no. Um, and that's pretty powerful. Do you think that it's a, ma- a matter of practice? I mean, do we, do we just need to get into that rhythm and know what we're uh, what we're interested in, what we are focused on or what we should be focused on? I mean, there are some people where, again, when we talk about this stuff, it's, I, hey, I'm a busy schedule. I've got stuff going on all day today. I can't afford mm. to look at stuff that I shouldn't. So how do I train my relevant slash irrelevant muscle, you know? That's a really good question. Again, I can't give you a complete answer because I can only speak from my personal experience. And that's that actually I'm really bad at this stuff, just left to my own devices. I'm not an efficient person <laughs> at all. And so I've, this is the reason I got into, you know, into thinking about this kind of stuff, which is that you know, in order for me to function, and for me, it was, it was really a kind of black and white thing. It was like, well, I either you know, struggle with mental health issues and you know, just generally not do very much as a person or make myself a little bit more successful. So yeah, for me, it was about habitualizing it. And I mean that in a in a very precise way, because to turn something into a habit, you've got to think about what are the triggers, uh, what are the behaviors or the routines that you go through, but crucially, what are the rewards or the cravings that drive the trigger? And actually, I structured the book around that that concept of the habit loop. So when you're looking at the kind of at the information you're dealing with, if you're saying no to stuff, you know, what are the things that you're getting? Are you getting a little, you know, endorphin hit that, yes, I've just added a bit of clarity to my day. And if you're conscious of that, then you know, perhaps that becomes something that, you know, is a positive, it's a positive decision to make. I think that makes sense. I like that idea. Mm. Speaking of the the habit loop, let's cover that real quick so people understand sure. what that is, because I think sometimes we, we forget how, uh, let's use the word programmable, uh, we can be in how, and I, I use the term muscle memory often, but really muscle memory is not even muscle memory, it's brain memory, which I guess <laughs> is a muscle, so whatever. Uh, I'm talking in circles, much like the habit loop. So what <laughs> is the habit loop? So the habit loop, um, and by the way, the very best resource that I found to, to really kind of get to grips with this concept is a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And I would really recommend it to anybody who's interested in this stuff. But the habit loop is essentially a very, very simple way of describing the way that um, your brain internalizes behaviors. And it's fascinating from a philosophical point of view, because I think it it describes your brain almost as a programmable computer rather than something with free will. And, um, you know, that's, I think, probably fairly controversial, but the the concept is quite compelling. And the idea is that, you know, let's say, uh, I don't know, in the in the evening, um, it's been a hard day and I might want to buy a bar of chocolate, for instance, right? And, uh, you know, so I put on a bit of weight while I'm doing that. And obviously, I'd like to change that. That's that's a, an unhealthy habit that I'd like to fix. Um, so what are my triggers? Is it low blood sugar? Is it boredom? Is it just the, the fact that I might just crave a positive experience after a difficult day? And so if you're describing, you know, the cravings that are driving this. And what's the routine? Well, the routine is I buy a bar of chocolate and I and I scoff it down. Could I possibly replace that with a new routine? Could I buy a uh, you know, some vegetables instead of the, instead of the bar of chocolate, for instance. Um, so you can experiment and you can find, you can find a different habit that's a little bit more healthy. But if you think about it as those three steps, what was the trigger? You know, it's the end of the day. What are my cravings? Is it the blood sugar? Is it some, you know, different change of scenery? Is it a positive experience or, you know, whatever? And what's the routine? And can I insert a new routine that satisfies the cravings and that, you know, that I can trigger under those circumstances? Does that make sense? Yes, definitely. And in, in fact, it's it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing, mm. uh, you, you know, where I, I think it's uh, – there's probably a quote that I'm going to botch here, but something <laughs> along the lines of our habits make us, but also we make our habits. Right. And it's, and it's again, a ha- it's, a, it's an altogether different kind of habit loop. So I think perhaps um, it's one of the many things that, uh, you know, we have a lot more control over than we think we do. Do, well, uh, and and what do you mean by that exactly? Because I was going to say sometimes when it comes to habits, we think that we don't have control, mm. or or we don't have control because we have inadvertently and, and or accidentally made these habits without intentional thinking. So mm. we've you know we've taken actions without intentional thinking. So we've had this absence of intentional action, mm. and then we've created 
unintentional actions because these habits are now driving us. Absolutely. Well, a habit is a, a habit isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, a habit is a you know is a function that the brain has evolved in order to almost shortcut a series of behaviors because thinking things through consciously is a very it's a very intensive and energy draining process. Um, and the brain is a lazy organ, right? It wants to automate as much as it possibly can. And so, you know, this is just one thing that, um, you know, you, you can either say, okay, well, that these are healthy habits because uh, just logically and consciously they're achieving a result that I would like that, you know, that I'm eating healthily or that I'm, you know, I'm capturing information correctly or they're unhealthy, which is, you know, it could be that I'm eating badly or that you know my way of handling emails is is kind of schizophrenic so i think that when you're um you know when you're looking at it you should really treat them as a tool uh, rather than as something that you should be fighting against and then also using them as an opportunity to adopt new behaviors that are quite useful and again this was one of the key premises for the productivity habits which is that you know there's a lot of new stuff in there but a lot of it is uh, structured around concepts that have been out for a while, um, getting things done being a good example. But I wanted to create some sort of language to help people adopt, uh, adopt it uh, without really having to work too hard. Okay, I, I, I think I get what you're saying. And, and mm. so in part, the the habits themselves, like if you have bad habits, you don't have anybody to blame but yourself. Right. However, the good news is, is you can reprogram those habits. Those, those habits are, in a sense, they're, they're agnostic. They're neutral. In other words, mm. you set them up and they can be good and bad. So that's the great thing here. Precisely. Okay. So then in the book, you're talking about – wait, how many total? I think it's what, eight or nine? Eight habits. Okay. I knew it was, I knew it was one of those numbers. Um, <laughs> I, and the book is structured differently than regu – well, regular books. Um, regular people don't read these kinds of books. Smart people do. <laughs> and uh, – it's set up you, – you explained that it's not set up in a traditional start at the beginning and read through the entire book uh, reading style. Now, mm. can you expand on that? Yeah, totally. Um, again, it's just based on, on my experience. You know, I read um, a lot of books, uh, a lot of self-help books, and I'm likely to agree with every single word and nothing changes. And that annoys me. <laughs> it really does. Um, and it's because – I might agree with something intellectually, but it doesn't change my behaviors. And in order for something to change my behaviors and actually getting things done, which I first read, oh gosh, must have been maybe 2005, um, 2004, 2005. You know, for me, that was um, a, an exception because it made such a compelling intellectual case for solving this, this sort of problem. But a lot of books, I mean, you know, I don't want to pick on <laughs> pick on authors living or dead but then there's a lot of them out there that speak an awful lot of sense but it makes it very difficult to adopt because you know they just expound these concepts in a sort of you know logical way but yeah i wanted to do something that people could actually adopt and so the idea with the productivity habits is that you focus on each habit in turn and you know you might spend six months just you know practicing and getting into the habit of you know even just the first one or two but once you've mastered that habit, once that's once that's internalized, you then focus on the next one and then the next one in layers. And by the time you've done all eight, then hopefully you'll be an awful lot more effective, I hope. Yeah, definitely. So what are some of the most impactful habits? I mean, if you don't have to go page by page through the book, mm. what's what's like a quick win, I guess? OK, the biggest win. Um, and again, um, you know, <laughs> this is going to really heavily agree with people like David Allen and Merlin Mann, etc. Is just capturing information, just getting it out of your head as soon as you, as soon as an idea comes to mind. It's the most, you know, simple thing in the world, and I, this is common sense, but it's if you can get into the habit of doing that consistently, it is it has the biggest impact because what you're doing is freeing your brain from having to store that information. You know, your brain is is cpu it's not ram so if an, I if an idea that you know something may put in the book if the idea is good enough to have it's good enough to write down so don't filter it just get it out and only when you come to process it later do you then say you know do i want to do this yes or no yeah in other words don't analyze it right then and there get it out of your head so that you can still pay attention to what it is you're supposed to be paying attention to at that moment you know i i get abuse from my friends uh from this constantly but i have a a waterproof notepad in my shower Nice. And I've got another one where I shave. And, 
you know, at least trim the beard. I'm growing a beard. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and and what's funny is is there are a lot of people who I mean you notice that uh, there there's nothing there's usually nothing to capture with in the shower. But I know you and uh, a, a good handful of other people that are friends that. That is where when we've got almost a sensory deprivation, even though there's other senses going on like the the heat or cool of the water, the sound mm. of the water, et cetera, we're, we're not staring at lots of different things trying to uh, decide what to do with them. In the shower, we've already have the habits in place where, OK, you mm. do this, you do this, you do this. You don't <laughs> think about it anymore. So – it's it's funny, isn't it, that this is that so many people report this in the shower, and it's uh, you know it's something that you'd sort of expect to be a very um, you know individual thing. But you know, I have a, a pet theory, um, and I don't know whether this is nonsense or not. But um, my theory is that most people tend to shower pretty shortly after they wake up, and teenagers notwithstanding. Um, but um, I think I don't know. I might be struggling with some sort of problem or struggling with, you know, some kind of concept. And one of the most powerful tools um, that I've spotted for solving, for solving problems is sleep. So one of the things that I try and do if I'm, you know, trying to resolve some sort of issue, um, I'll go to bed thinking about a problem, but in a very sort of open way. I'm not going to, you know, be kind of focusing on it too hard. And more than half of the time, by the time I wake up and, you know, by the time I'm in the shower, that I, a solution is going to come to me. And so just recording it is, you know, <laughs> just make sure that I'm not going to forget it. It's a simple thing. And I bet you that a lot of people have noticed that. But if you can get consistent about capturing that and then utilizing that as a process, my God, I mean, you know, the impact for solving problems is is pretty, you know, is pretty big. How many things – I think that uh, capturing is one of those things where we, we really do forget how powerful that is. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, again, the, the, the second part is, is – deciding what to do with the things that we capture. But mm. I mean, I, I used to have a little notebook that I would keep in my pocket with a, a, a pen, not a clicky one, but a, where you take the top off. And that was before we had, you know, pocket phone computers mm. <laughs> everywhere. I still hesitate sometimes to, to pull out a phone and randomly write something down at all times. Something pops in my head just because I almost feel like when I do that, it's going to pull me out of the moment that I'm in. But then again, I mean, if I can pull that thing out of my head that's distracting me or occupying a, a percentage of my mental RAM at the time, mm -hmm. if I can pull that out and put it away, then I and, and quote unquote close that program down in my head, then I can get back to what it is I'm supposed to be doing mm. more easily. So, absolutely. Did you um, by any chance take a look at um, habit three in the book, the right tools? Yes, yeah, and and that's something I struggle with all the time. Mm. What did you What did you make of the argument? Um, let's see. What What's the argument again? Let me re review here. I've got the book right here. By the way, <laughs> the, the book is a. I, I've got the hardcover here that you were nice enough to send me overseas, even which was kind of cool to get a you know an overseas package in the mail. I love that it's set up like a notebook where there's a bookmark piece in it. There's the little strap around it to close it. So it's almost like a it was con it's almost constructed like one of the notebooks you would take notes in but it's already filled which is nice so let's see chapter three here and or habit three i should say that's right um, yeah so the the argument um with the right tools was that um uh, you know it, it, you can say that any information tool that you're deep <clears throat> excuse me that you're dealing with everything from a uh, a, a cuneiform clay tablet from 5,000 years ago to a pencil to a computer. Um, it all sort of it sits on this continuum. Um, and you could do a very simple graph and you could say, well, on one side, I've got entropy, which is, you know, the amount of information I can generate at any instant. So with a pen, I can make any two dimensional shape or with my voice, I can make any sound and uh, abstraction, which is the number of layers of behavior that I've got to force this information through or how, you know, on the other hand, on the other hand, you could say, well, it's very intuitive. So, you know, using a computer is something that you've got to learn. So what I've noticed, and I did this, did this little experiment, um, just running some numbers, is that there are two very distinct clusters of analog and digital tools, analog being high entropy and low abstraction, and digital tools being uh, low entropy and high abstraction. 
And there's some interesting properties that you can get there. So if you're using an analog tool like a pen when you're taking notes, it's a very sensory uh, experience. There's a lot of movement. It's about, you know, there's a lot of feel. And you're using, uh, it's, it's almost sort of more linguistic. Um, you know, if you've ever noticed co- you're coming up with good ideas when you're talking with friends, it's, uh, that's no coincidence or when you're handwriting. But it makes it very difficult to structure that information. And that's where digital tools tend to be a little, str- a little stronger. So if you have that information in mind, you can say, well, I'm trying to capture information right now. I'm trying to, uh, you know, disgorge some great idea from my mind. But that's something where, you know, it, I might just want to form it. I might want to explore it a little bit while I'm capturing it. And by far and away, the better tool for that is the analog tool. I remember now. <laughs> mm. um, it's very much the way that uh, I, I discovered I should do a podcast instead of a blog. How did that come about? Well, I knew that I was very much a talk thinker. I had to speak something out loud or talk it out with somebody to know what I really thought about it or have my ideas fully flow out. But they didn't tend to have enough structure. And then the second, you know, it was it was easier for me to then, and you can even sense this when I'm talking, where I will do an aside, <laughs> almost a, per, a parenthetical speech bubble in the middle of audible speech, where, like I just did, where, um, <laughs> see, it, it, all of this, now, now what's cool is, is I've figured out since that uh, turning on the dictation and speaking in my microphone, but having the computer take all of this down as text notes, that then I have a really rough draft sitting there of text that I can then cut, copy, paste, etc. into a better order form. And then I could even, if depending upon the medium, go back and read it again, but read it uh, in a better and more in a better articulated fashion. So yeah, there's different, I I definitely still feel like there's a part of me that's just going to stop using my phone as a instant quick note taker and go back to the pen and paper, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I I don't want to get prescriptive about it. And the reason is that is twofold, which is first that, you know, there's an awful lot of subjectivity in this. Um, But the second is that, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to date the stuff that I write about by focusing on the state of the art as of 2015, because, you know, in, in five years, that's going to look ridiculous. But yeah, I, I guess it, what it's, what you're sort of doing is you're, you're, you're kind of implying a two, a sort of a two stage process. Um, one of capturing essentially. So externalizing information and then the other being compiling it, you know, turning it into the finished article. So I suppose when you're uh, polishing you know what you've what you've captured. You're not writing so much as editing, and that's quite an yes. interesting distinction. Yes, and I think that's you know I mean there's there's the whole thing about writing where you write the first time without editing, and then you go back and and make it sound good or polish it later. And I think there's definitely a difference between uh, you know what. So you're saying that there's definitely a method, not a method. There is a a difference between the tool you use for the first draft, so to speak, or whatever it is you're creating, and the part where you start to mold that into something that's towards a final. Uh, Not a, yeah, position. totally. Not only is there a difference, I'd actually go so far as to say that it's a, you're, you know, you're, you've got a totally different job when you're editing mm. in, that, in that sense here. Um, your activity is completely different. Your mindset is completely different. And possibly the tools you're using are completely different. Oh, man. It's a pretty deep concept. There's, and that's just <laughs> one of the many concepts, actually, in the book, The Productivity Habits. Uh, ben, it's been awesome to talk with you, and I'm sure this will not be your last time on the show. How can people get a hold of this? Where can people find you online and get this awesome book like I have it here in my hand? <laughs> cool. Um, so I'm on Amazon. Um, it's uh, available um, around the world, but um, if you're in the US and Canada, it's on Amazon uh, at the moment, likewise in the UK. Um, it's on iBooks and uh, Google Play as well. Um, so if you want an electronic version, that's a good place to get it. If you want to find out a bit more about the stuff that I do and how slow a writer I really am, um, <laughs> I've got a, a blog, which is uh, inkandben.com. And that's uh, I-N-K-A-N-D-B-E-N.com. Um, and I tweet using at Ink Ben. Ink and Ben. Thank you, Ben, mm-hmm. Elijah, for joining me on this episode. It's been awesome talking with you. Thanks for having me, Eric. 
I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know I did. I know that Ben and I probably could have talked a lot longer, and I think Ben will have to come back. I know in post-show that you did not get to hear, we talked about some of his future ideas for books and things he is currently working on. So I say he's one to follow. Go to Ink and Ben. That's I N K A N D B E N dot com. You can find everything you need to about the productivity habits, his book, which is awesome. I love the hardcover notebook esque feeling of this book. This is definitely one of those ones where it's worth grabbing in a tangible copy and flipping through. Then again, you know, the iTunes version and Kindle versions are great as well. So. The digital version would be just as cool seeing on a big screen and being able to take a screenshot of it and write on it with your finger and things like that. So either way, again, inkandben.com. Go tell Ben. Thank you. That's also his username on Twitter, at Ink and Ben. Thanks again to Doodle for sponsoring this episode of Beyond the To-Do List. Go to beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle to get started right away, taking the hassle and headache out of scheduling your online meetings with one or more people. I can't stress enough how awesome a tool this is. Probably one of my top five tools. Seriously. Anyway, go check it out. Beyondthetodolist.com slash doodle. Thanks again for listening. If you're enjoying this podcast like I am, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And make sure to go to iTunes to subscribe and or leave a rating and review to let me know how you are liking the show beyond the to-do list.com slash iTunes. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you next episode. Beyond the To-Do List is a proud member of the Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, delve into science fiction and philosophy, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.